Life Audio. Hey, 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 everybody. My son William was born 14 weeks early. Yeah, he was the preemie. He fit in the palm of my hand. Having faith is not always easy. Welcome back to my podcast. I'm Billy Yancey. Please hit the subscribe button. So I'm going to tell you a story, a story about my son, William. Just a little disclaimer. Ahead of time, I might get a little misty. This, this, is, this is quite a story. So for uh, all the battles in my life, I'm 54 years old. My son, Williams, was the toughest. William was born 14 weeks early on September 11, 2006 at 1.32 a.m. in the morning. He's a 26 weeker. You know, full term birth is 40 weeks. So that was that was a really big deal. He, he was he was a preemie. He only weighed one pound, 14 ounces. Literally, he could fit in the palm of my hand. He had a uh, serious brain bleed. He had brain bleeds on both on right and left hemisphere, and most of the brain matter in the left side of his brain was gone, like completely gone. See it on x-ray, see it on pictures, it's completely gone. Brain matter's gone. William has what's called cerebral palsy, which is this disorder that affects your muscles, affects movement. One of the side effects is called spasticity, which means certain muscles are constantly contracted. Like, you know, I'd get a cramp. Yeah, so that's, it's, it's always been that way with William. All of this, all of this was caused by his underdeveloped brain. The fact that he was born, born so early. I recall his doctor coming in. We had a meeting, very cold. I mean, it's just a very cold environment, very cold. His language, just everything was just cold and dark. But he said to us, it was me, <clears throat> my wife at the time, my parents, Jean and Clyde, and he said 65% of these cases fail. And he, you know, he encouraged us to, term- to terminate William. Clyde jumped up quickly. He said, we believe in a higher being. We will go with the 35%. And I chimed in and I said, if William's in there fighting, you know, tag on it, we're out here fighting too. Today, I'm proud to say William is 16 years old. He's about to go to high school. He loves to play basketball, loves to play baseball. Very charismatic, charismatic. Just, uh, they call him at school, they call him, they call him Hollywood, right? Cause he's, he's, he's uh, Mr. Personality. His favorite subjects in cla- in, in school are math and PE. Now PE, I can understand math, so, not so much. He's, he loves math, he loves science, loves PE. I wrote this poem I'd like to read to you that describes how I felt, how it felt when William was in the NICU. When I was a little boy, one of my favorite things to do was play my Mattel handheld football game. It was a little bigger than an iPhone. It was about six inches long and three and a half inches wide. William was barely that size when he was born. It was all white and had six small buttons to play defense, kick, and score touchdowns. The object of the game was to defend and score. I loved it. I played it for hours and lost all sense of time. When you scored, a cluster of beeps would play. I'll never forget the melody. As I lay at William's bedside in the NICU, I'd often hear a cluster of beeps, kind of like my Mattel handheld. Similar, but much different. This was no game. The beeps were indicators, not touchdowns. Indicators of oxygen flowing. Indicators of breathing. Indicators of life. The beeps were constant in the beginning. Intimidating. Overpowering. Annoying. They seemed to play for hours. I'd lose all sense of time. After a while... It was just background noise until that dreaded squeal, a high-pitched sound followed by a really low 
dull growl. I'll never forget the melody. I loathed that sound. It mean it meant apnea and bradycardia. Apnea meant that William stopped breathing for more than 20 seconds and caused his heart rate to fall under 100 beats per minute, bradycardia. Normal was 120 to 160. His immature nervous and muscular system gave him a condition called apnea of prematurity, meaning at times his brain either failed to tell him to breathe or his immature muscular system wasn't strong enough to keep his airway open. When William lost his breath, I held mine. When his heart slowed, my heart raced and sank. The small, six small buttons to defend and score were nowhere in sight. I felt helpless. There is scared and there is afraid. I was afraid. Look at William, look at the monitor, look up for a nurse. Look at William, look at the monitor, Look up for the nurse. Look at William. Look at the monitor. Look up for a nurse. Finally, a nurse. She gets William settled, resets the monitor. He's fine, she says, and walks away. I'd exhale. Kind of like when I was a little boy. When I lost my Mattel handheld. Look in my room. Look under my bed. Look under the couch. Look in my room, look under my bed, look under the couch. My mom, she would find it, settle me down, hand it to me, and walk away. I'd exhale. Similar, but much, much different. Again, I will never forget the doctor telling us that the wise decision would be to let William go. This was never an option, never. There's a teaching you may have heard of. There's a teaching about the finger and the moon. The teaching is merely a vehicle that describes truth. Don't mistake it for the truth itself though. A finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. The finger is needed to know where to look for the moon. But if you mistake the finger for the moon, itself, you will never know. Now where William was, presently, was not where he was going to be. Where William was when he was one pound 14 ounces is not where he was going to be. God had bigger things in store, bigger things in the near future and years to come. But all through that that time period I was going through, it seemed like, you know, it seemed like hell. Um, people would ask me, are you okay? And I would say, you know, I would just say, yeah, I'm okay. Because I don't want to, I don't want to talk about it. You know, it was, it was, it was heavy. It was awful. That whole experience. I would walk by the, the nursery, you know, they had the, the one was in intensive care and to get to the bathroom, you walk out of intensive care and you walk past the nursery where like the normal size babies are. These babies look like, oh my gosh, they look like floats. And then in the Macy's Day Parade, they were huge. And William was just, you know, he was just a little bitty thing. As I said, you know, he, he fit literally in the palm of my hand. And that was intimidating, you know, but either way, to me in my head, those giant babies were Goliath. And William, William was my David. And I hung on to that. You know, there's a saying, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And I think about William's strength. You know, if I'm, if William's the apple and I'm the tree, then how strong am I? Because I think William is just, his strength is just, it's, it's just amazing. What he went through, what he's gone through, what he's accomplished, where he is today, and through all of that, you know, I never questioned God why. I never asked why. I just felt like I didn't have a right to ask God why. Who was I to ask why? And interesting enough, a few years after William was born, my buddies, uh, 
wife had a baby and they invited me to come and see the baby in the hospital. And it was really strange. It was really strange because there were no monitors. There was no bradycardia. There was no oxygen. There was no beeps. There's no apnea. There was no monitors. It was just hanging out, eating pizza. And it was just really, really strange for me. But I remember leaving the hospital and finally getting to my car and I just broke down in tears. I was just, just overwhelmed with just, I don't know, well, there was hate, not hate, but anxiety and just hurt and just, I just hurt. I was in a lot of pain. And, you know, so today, our message is about faith. It's about faith. Our scripture is, comes from the book of Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 37. For nothing will be impossible without God. Nothing. Nothing. The lesson is to have faith, even when things are bleak, even when things seem like there's no way out. I encourage you to believe in a positive outcome. You know, they say faith is be believing and common sense says not to. It's easy to say, but let me tell you something. Sometimes it's really not that, that easy to do. But I encourage you, regardless of what's going on, what's happened, what others say, what people say can't happen, I encourage you to have faith in the unseen. Don't be fooled, don't be dismayed. No amount of pain, no amount of sorrow, no amount of grief, whatever the, the challenge, there's nothing God can't do, nothing. Thank you, thank you for joining me today in our podcast. Please, please remember to hit su subscribe. Allow me to take a moment to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you will find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and much, much more. Hello, hello, Quinice Petway here, co-host of the Your Daily Bible Verse podcast. Are you someone who loves to take a deep dive into God's word one verse at a time to explore his will for your life and desire to draw closer to him? If that sounds like you, I'd love to invite you to head over to lifeaudio.com and search your daily Bible verse to tune in and subscribe for daily inspiration, life application, and spiritual transformation through the in-depth exploration of God's word. It's a crazy world out there, moms and dads, and raising our kids to stand strong in the faith is tough. I'm Katherine Seegers, host of Christian Parent Crazy World, a podcast that answers the questions that keep us parents up at night. Questions like, um, is it okay to question God and the Christian faith? How do I help my kids to have an authentic faith? Wait, wait a second. Is the Bible just a book written by some ancient dead guys? <laughs> yeah. For answers to these questions and more, subscribe to Christian Parent Crazy World at lifeaudio.com.